takes one of us to say enough is enough i'm mm-hmm. not going to say why can't someone do something about it i'm going to say what is it that i can do about it and once you start to say it is my responsibility i can make a difference everything changes this is episode number 101 of the inspiring talk with billionaire Naveen Jain. Welcome guys to The Inspiring Talk. My name is Vijay Gautam. I'm your host for this show. Each week I interview today's most successful and inspiring personalities to help you realize your inner potential. I'm very excited for my guest Naveen Jain. Naveen is a serial entrepreneur and a billionaire who hails from a small village in the state of Uttar Pradesh. He went to IIT Roorkee and later moved to the United States. Naveen is the founder of several innovative companies like Viome where he aims to make disease optional by understanding the gut microbiome. He also is the founder of Blue Dot Moon Express and Infospace. Naveen was featured on Forbes Wall Street Journal, Inc., and so on. His audacious vision and magnetic personality continually inspire others to follow what feels impossible. This episode is not only going to inspire you to dream big, but also to achieve them. You will hear us talk about how Navin thinks about problems, how he spot crazy business ideas, how to develop intellectual curiosity, how Navin learns. and a lot take a seat back and enjoy the conversation welcome back inside this episode guys i am super excited to have with me here navin zaid navin thank you so much for joining me well uh, vijay it's an absolute honor and a pleasure to be with you i can't believe this is happening i mean it's uh, it's such an honor to have you here navin i i came to know about you almost 3 years back and i saw you know here is this guy who came from india and he's talking about this crazy crazy ideas of you know uh, not taking people to the moon but bringing moon's resources back here in the earth and then i was like wow that's uh, you know that's some crazy crazy ideas and obviously that's one of the a lot of crazy ideas that you have and that you have been working on um so i want to start with this quote that you have you know once uh, shared in one of the interviews where you have said passion is for losers obsession is for entrepreneurs what do you mean by that but i think what happens is that everyone talks about that you know you have to be passionate about doing things you're doing and to me you know passion is for hobbies you know you wake up in the morning and say i'm passionate about collecting space stuff so you see all the space stuff behind me that's my passion but when it comes to obsession what is it that you wake up in the morning jumping out of the bed thinking about it what is that something you go to bed thinking about it what is one thing that you're willing to die for and to me that is what really matters ask yourself simple question what am i willing to die for and then live for it right and then you see God, you know if you could have everything that you want in life you have billions of dollars you have loving family you have everything you want what would you do and if that's what you do now is going to allow you to get everything that you want and one simple way to know when you really are working that you something that you're obsessed with is it doesn't matter what time you wake up i get up at 4 a.m. every day if you're not jumping out of the bed and is still thinking about can i lie in the bed for another 5 minutes can i just put a snooze button find something else to do that is not your obsession people who are obsessed they wake up wide eyed and jumping out of joy and jump out of the bed that's awesome so what is it that's uh, you know pulling you out of the bed lately what is that that you are extremely excited about uh, you know as we are talking right now you know right now my 100% of my focus is on really on chronic diseases because to me if there is one problem you know despite all this pandemic or that we see about covid and stuff you know this is once in a 100 years problem the last pandemic was you know 1980 but the point i'm trying to make now if you look at today there is an epidemic 
of chronic diseases. People are, you know, obese, diabetes, heart diseases, autoimmune diseases, cancers, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, depression, anxiety. These are all chronic diseases. And what I mean by these chronic diseases are, these are non-communicable diseases. It's not something like you wake up in the morning and say, I think, you know, I might have caught diabetes today. It doesn't, you don't True. catch these diseases. You don't wake up in the morning and suddenly find you say, I think I became obese last night. You don't become <laughs> obese, right? Yeah. And so my point is that to me is really, if you look at the humanity, if there is one problem that could be solved, if you could solve this problem, is going to help billions of people live better lives. To me, that is what, you know, I go to bed thinking about it. That's what I jump out of the bed thinking about it, is that how do you solve this problem? And I'm going to, you know, give you a little bit more about the framework that Ed, you talked about these audacious ideas, these moonshot ideas. How do you go about thinking about them and then actually making them real? True. Yeah, awesome. So I'll get into that in a moment about the, you know, moonshot ideas and how do you think about that. But before I talk about that, you know, Navin, you come from a small village in UP uh, with a, you know, very humble beginning, like a most of, you know, people who are listening to this podcast and, you know, a lot of us. And uh, what made you dream this crazy big in your life? Like, how did you develop this mindset, right? So please, you know, talk about that, right? You, You were the kid who was there at IIT Roorkee, you know, studying engineering. And then now here you are with all this, I mean, where was that? Remember a particular incident where you said, okay, you know what, I want to do something big or it's uh, like a, a lot of ideas after ideas and then it's uh, over the period of time. Yeah, so life is really a continuum. I mean, you know, a lot of people somehow believe there is this magical thing that happens one day. It's really that. It is things build on top of each other and they slowly, slowly keeps building. And as people say, it's the last straw that breaks the camel's back. And it's like always the last thing you remember and say, oh, that's it. And the answer is that is never it. Because you have been really thinking about it for the longest time. You know, as you mentioned, you know, came from in the villages in India where people were told not to dream. Because, you know, to dream meant failure. Dream meant something you can't achieve and that it brings you black mark in your, you know, not just to yourself, but to your family. You know, like, look at that crazy guy. He thought he could. And look at now his dad is in debt because that crazy guy burned everything he had, right? And yeah. My point is, we are so afraid to fail that we we fail to live, right? Because we always worry about what if it doesn't work and we never live our dreams. And in fact, if you would, you know, if you ask me, you know, countries like India, if you want some of the brilliant, most brilliant ideas, you can find them in one place. We call them graveyards, right? They mean the best ideas died because no one ever took them out of their brain to go do something about it. And, you know, so to me, it is never, it is not about who you are. It's not about where you are born. It's not about how little you have. It is about you wanting to make a difference and make a change and everything will come to you. I mean, if you look at Elon today, I mean, I remember Elon, you know, you go back, Elon was almost bankrupt. Elon was living in his friend's couch with no money. And today he's one of the top 10 richest person in the world. Why? The crazy idea. The guy said, Mm. I want to build an electric car. No one told him that not even there's no car company that has been created in 50 years, let alone an electric car company. But the crazy guy thought it could be done. Right? My point is, it takes one of us to say enough is enough. I'm mm-hmm. not going to say, why can't someone do something about it? I'm going to say, what is it that I can do? about it. And once you start to forget, you know, say, it is my responsibility, it is I can make a difference, everything changes. And you know, it's it's the land of Mahatma Gandhi. He didn't say, how am I, you know, this frail, thin, frail guy is going to fight the British army. He said, you know, yes, we can do that. And we're going to do it in a way doesn't provoke them. Because when you are non-wild, 
everyone knows how to deal with the violence, but very few people know how to deal with the non-violence, right? And he dealt with the British army in a way that they never dealt with it, right? And to me, the point is, this is a land where we know an individual has come out of the same place and made a tremendous difference. Everyone you look in India who has succeeded, they all have the same story. And if you look at even the people who are in the United States, and now, you know, I remember when I came to this country, give or take about 38 years ago, we were all told, you know, the immigrants are really hard workers. They make great individual contributors. They make great engineers. But even you know, the managers, they don't understand the culture. They mm. will never make a good manager. They don't really are good leaders, right? Now, how much time had changed? The head of the Microsoft is Indian. The head of the Google is Indian. The head of IBM is Indian. And you start to look at, did we really genetically somehow change? <laughs> right? Our genes really haven't changed. What has mm. suddenly happened is we, you know, what is really interesting is when, you know, if you look at the Indians in the United States, they didn't ask that they needed to be given the respect. When they realized they're working for these large companies, they did not get the respect and say, screw you, I'm going to go start my own company. And when mm. those companies did really, really well, these large companies bought them for billions of dollars. Suddenly the guy who wasn't a good leader now became a good leader because we didn't wait for someone to tell us we are a good leader. We proved mm. it to them we are a good leader. So my point is, don't tell someone, hey, you are a racist. You're not giving me the respect. You earn respect by doing it, not for asking for it, right? When you go out that. and day in, day out, kick someone's ass, they're going to start respecting you pretty nicely. Oh, I think that's a very, very, you know, powerful lesson, right? And it also tells a lot about, like, where do you want to focus, right? Do you want to focus on fighting or do you want to focus on, like, putting your head down and doing the things so that, you know, you earn it, right? I love that. You know what? I'm very, very fascinated by the way you think about the problems and uh, and how you look at solving them, right? So I'd like to understand uh, what goes on your head when you see a complex problem, which a lot of people think is impossible to solve. And then how, how do you go about like thinking about like a really complex problem? Yeah. So actually, it's really interesting. There are a couple of frameworks I would give it give you because I really think, so if you look at something like, for example, let's say, you know, people say, going to the Mars, it is very difficult. It cannot be done. You cannot go do that, right? Instead of saying it can't be done, if you were to just simply reframe that question and saying, what technologies need to be true or have to happen before this happens? That means if you're going to land on the moon, what are the steps that need to happen for it to be possible? So number one, we have to be able to find a way to get out of the Earth atmosphere into the stratosphere. Great. You need a rocket. Got it. Check mark. Somebody built that already. Now, well, we have to be able to go from there into the long trips to get to the Mars. That may take six months. Is it possible? Okay. So that is already being done. That problem has been solved. Then how are you going to descend? Because there is no atmosphere. It's going to come down really, really fast. And there's seven minutes of hell. How are you going to deal with that? And my point is you start to go down and say, okay, once we land there, what needs to happen when we need to have a people for in people to have food? How are we going to get the food? Well, what if the food is not the problem? What if we really need to ask a different question there? Instead of saying, how are we going to grow the food on the Mars? Instead, ask the question, why do humans need to eat the food? Oh, right? wow. Because just by simply saying, if you were to say how to grow the food on the Mars, the only solution is to grow the food. But if you were to just simply say, why do we eat food? And someone for a second will say, what do you mean? It's like, why do we eat food? And you say, oh, because we need, we eat food because we need energy and we eat food because we need nutrition. And you say, oh, can we now get the energy in many ways? Can we get energy like many bacterial species that grow in radioactive nuclear waste? What do they do? Not only they have learned to protect their DNA from the high radiation, they have also developed the system that actually uses radiation as a source of energy. Now, can we take the genetic material from those bacteria, use CRISPR to modify our own genes, 
and now suddenly we can get energy from radiation. Could we use photosynthesis like plants do? Plants wow. can survive in the sun. So can we use a photosynthesis to get energy? Now, what kind of nutrition do we need? Well, we need hydrogen, we need oxygen, we need nitrogen. Well, guess what? If we can find water, won't that give us hydrogen and oxygen? The nitrogen thing is interesting. Maybe there is a nitrogen on the Mars. If not, let's figure out how we're going to carry enough nitrogen. But now the problem of living on the Mars is simply about finding the nitrogen or taking the nitrogen. Then say, wow. well, that problem can be solved, right? And it's, so you take these very complex problem, you break it down into steps and say, ask a different question that anyone mm. else is asking. And I think that is a fundamental way of taking any complex problem and breaking it down. And by the way, the same thing applies to any uh, any time you start a company. Those are exactly the framework I, you know, I tell people I go through myself. So when I start any company, uh, BJ, I ask myself three questions. Why this? Why now? Why me? And there is a reason for doing that. Why this is, the first question you have to ask yourself is, God forbid, if this, I'm actually successful in solving this problem, it, would it actually help a billion people live a better life? And the reason I say that is because if you can help any time, 100 million people, million people, billion people live a better life, whatever that means, you can create a billion dollar company, $10 billion company or $100 billion company. So if you focus on finding a problem that is big enough that helps people, you can create a company. You never go out to say, I want to create a $100 billion company. You say, I want to create a company that helps a billion people because that's how you get there. The second part of the problem is why now? And the why now really is about what had changed in the last two years, three years, five years that allows you to solve the problem today than it would mm. have been done, say, a decade ago. And the reason for that is if nothing had changed and it's the same technology, then you have to believe that you're not the smartest guy in the world. Somebody would have solved that problem. So you have to really see what has really changed now that either that makes the problem more relevant today or that allows me to solve the problem. And I'll tell you how I applied all these three things to uh, uh, the company I just started, right? So in this case, when I started Wyom with a simple uh, idea, what if we can create a world where being sick is a choice? That means, can we actually prevent and reverse chronic diseases by understanding what's happening inside the human body? So to me, why, you know, why this was very simple. God forbid, if it, we are successful in doing there will be 7 billion people whose life would be better because of this solution. So why this was checkmark? Why now was very interesting. He said, to solve this problem, there have to be three things that have to happen. The cost of digitizing the human body, because unless you can understand every biochemical activity in the body, you can't find the solution to it. So you have to digitize it. Digitize means you have to be able to sequence everything in your body. That means cost of sequencing has to come down from $10,000 to $1,000 to $100 to $10. And I saw that happening three years ago. But that time the cost was 100, I knew it was coming down to 10, today we sit down at $10, right? So point was, that was happening. And then we said, wait a sec, if you can digitize the human body, there's going to be massive amount of data. Is the cost of computing that data is going to be cheap enough that we can actually work on it? Because you're not going to have access to supercomputers. Guess mm. what? AWS was starting to come along where you could file, fire 1,000 cores at literally a pennies in the night, and you can have a massive amount of computing powers. So see, that is checkmark. The last part is now you have all this data that you have processed. Is there going to be powerful enough artificial intelligence that can make a sense of all this data? And that was pretty obvious that AI is becoming more and more powerful. Checkmark. Those three things were happening. I say, you know what? Time is now. Now, the last part is why me? And why me has two parts. Am I truly obsessed about solving this problem? The answer was yes. But there was a second part that I was just mentioning. When you look at this problem and saying, what, what is it about this problem that I think differently than someone else is thinking? Hmm. If everyone is asking the same question, guess what's happening? Everyone is solving the same problem. 
If you ask a different question, you're solving a different problem. That means you're no longer in the commodity business. So once I started to learn about this thing and saying, you know what, I'm starting to see a lot of research showing that chronic diseases are happening because of something that's happening in the gut microbiome. I don't Hmm. know what that is, but it seems to me something is magical happening in the gut microbiome. So I'm going to find what is going on. And then I say, wait a sec, if everyone believes that is where the problem is, and there are tens of companies looking at the gut microbiome, why is this problem not getting solved? And that means Mm -hmm. either I'm a moron or this problem (laughs) is like somewhere else. And to me, Mm -hmm. what was, wait a sec, what are the questions these tens of companies in the microbiome space are asking? It turns out they were asking the same question. They were trying to find out every single organism that is in the gut. And they thought once they knew what organisms are there, they'll be able to find out what causes the disease. Mm -hmm. My thought was, look, I don't understand that part. But what is very clear to me, it can't be what what the organisms are there. It has to be what they are producing. Because our body doesn't care who is there. Our body cares about what chemicals are being produced because that's the only thing it can sense. So I Mm. say, what if our focus is going to be on what they are producing, not who they are? And partly in my mind, it came from the fact, I say, what if these organisms are like human beings? They could be 100 different people doing exactly the same thing. So you can look at two people with diabetes, completely different organisms, but doing Mm. exactly the thing that causes diabetes. What if that's how like that is? Or, or, the same organism in your gut may be doing something good, but in my gut, in the ecosystem it is in, it is challenging to it and it's producing something toxin, just like human beings, right? Mm. When you are with a friend, you could be having fun, you go into a mob, you become totally a different person. You are at work, you are a different person. You are at home, you are a different person. What is changing? Not the person, but the environment, mm. right? So mm. what if the environment was the key and we should focus on what they are producing? And that allowed me to say, you know what, your genes. And another thing, by the way, the reason I focused on that was, it was clear to me that your genes don't change when you develop chronic diseases. So from the time you're born, you you have a DNA. Now, just because you gain 200 pounds, you can do a DNA test, it's still the same. When you become, have diabetes, your DNA hasn't changed. So your genes are never changing, whether you go into remission of a disease or you go into relapse of a disease. Your genes are still the same. So it has to be gene expression that is changing, not the genes, because gene expression is what makes us who we are. And that simple thing, not knowing that what is going on, as an entrepreneur, my job is to ask the question, not have the answer. And once I say, look, guys, we need to be building a technology that will allow us to see what they are producing, and we need to be not focusing on the genes, but their expression. People say, oh, you mean you have to do the RNA testing? And I say, well, that's the one, <laughs> right? <And laughs> I know, say, but that's the I one. Don't know, but that's what we need to do. That's what we're going to do. And they told me it cannot be done. This is impossible. And I said, well, that may be so. And then eventually we found the technology does exist at Los Alamos National Lab. And we found the technology. We licensed it and we created a company. But point was that simple, why this, why now, why me? is really the same framework you can apply to almost every single thing you do. And then you can take a very complex problem, break it down into simple specifics. And you know, a lot of people ask me that, you know, what are these genes and how do you know, how can you possibly say that genes don't matter? And I say, look, genes are like your thoughts, right? You can have good thoughts and you can have bad thoughts. As long as you don't express the bad thoughts, there is no crime. You can have all mm. the bad thoughts in the world, just don't express them, right? The same way with the genes. You can have good genes or the bad genes, but don't express the bad one. You're just fine, right? And that is literally the key is to find a way to get the right precise nutrition that will allow you to not express the bad one and get more of the good ones to be expressed. And that's literally what Wyom does. I mean, that's literally what we do. We analyze your body. After analyzing your body, we say, don't eat this food and why? Eat this food and why? And by the way, your body needs 22 milligram of elderberry, 11 milligram of lycopene, 7 milligram of curcumin. And guess what? We can now package them in a capsule and we can ship it to you just made just for you at that time. So literally Mm. precise supplements that are designed for you as an individual. 
And every wow. month as your body changes, we redesign them for you. I mean, my point was now you are able to measure what is happening. We're going to give you what you need. And when you do a retest, you can see all the improvement. There is no longer, believe me, trust me, have faith in it. You can see the results for yourself. Wow. That's really, really incredible. So um, before I move forward, I want to close this here. So, you know, you mentioned a lot about uh, developing this ability to ask different questions, right? So is this something that you have this natural ability or this is something that you have, uh, you know, practiced over the period of time? Like, let's say a lot of people, you know, oh, you know what, for, for a lot of things that you have shared, right? Even that example that you gave about the Mars or even this, uh, you know, the whole thing about making this is optional. The kind of questions that you're asking and a lot of people will be thinking, wow, I have never thought about that that way. Right? So how does, how does one develop this kind of ability to ask different questions in the first place? One is to look at the industry that you, are, you know nothing about. So the main thing is most people tend to think that the only problem they can solve is in the, what they have expertise in. So they believe if they don't know anything about it, that's the hardest problem for them to solve. To me, that is the easiest problem because I am not bounded by anything that uh, the experts have taken it for granted. Right? Because you don't know the uh, limits and the rules there. I don't know the mm. limit. I don't know what, what, why it can't be done. So I get to say, like, that is literally the challenge me is I ask my scientists, oh, that won't work. Help me understand why won't that work? And by the time they start explaining, they say, you know, let me think about it. I think it just might work. And he say, tell me why it might work. And by the time they literally get done, they say, it's a brilliant idea, right? And the point is because you keep never, because you find out. And if and there are times you're going to say it doesn't work and here's why and say, so how would you make it work? So let's assume it doesn't work, but what needs to happen for it to work? And then you keep drilling and you say, you know, for it to work, you have to be able to do that. Let's go find out if somebody can do that. And hmm. to me, it is really about never, ever thinking it can't be done. Find out, ask yourself what needs to happen for it to be possible. And that's how you go about poking around to see where the weak points are, where you know you can actually make a difference. Wow. So um, you are a great optimist and, uh, you know, you are extremely obsessed with your ideas that you have. And, uh, you know, you get all these different crazy ideas and I'm sure like they, some of them are getting executed, but I'm sure like there are a whole lot of other crazy ideas that, you know, keeps popping on your head because you are constantly reading and learning a lot about different things and, you know, uh, places, right? So when you have this some crazy idea, which feels like, oh, I think this is going to be like my next big idea that I can probably go and change about, right? So for a lot of entrepreneurs or the people who are looking at becoming entrepreneurs listening to this show, so... What do you tell when you have this crazy idea, which you have no experience about, uh, and you are not sure whether this is the idea that's going to be the big next idea or not? So how does that validation process look like? Do you go first and read more or do you talk to experts or how, what does that validation process look like for you? So first of all, anytime I enter any industry, I read a lot. There's just no two ways about it. And I never read one book on a subject because what happens when you read one book the author's view becomes your view. If you read mm. 10 books, then you have 10 different perspectives on the subject, and then you can create an 11th view, which is your own, right? If you say, oh, he's thinking this, he's thinking this, what if you connect the dots together and what if this was possible, right? Then I read a lot of research papers because what happens is the research papers tells you that where the trends are, what's the most cutting edge stuff that people are starting to talk about now. And when you start to look at that, you say, this is what is going to be coming out in five years where people are going to be talking about it. So four years ago, when I was reading the research paper, everybody in the research was talking about microbiome and there was nobody in the main press was talking about microbiome. Now you can pick up a GQ magazine and they talk about microbiome, right? Which is That's really great. surprising, right? So my point was, it, it's not something I had a crystal ball. I was reading this research. And by the way, same thing happening now. I'm now starting to see the same type of thing for the oral microbiome, the what's happening in our mouth cavity has more to do with our disease than anything else. And there's a wow. lot of research that's starting to come out. So like my mother used to say, chew your food. She was a scientist. Mm -hmm. She knew that those <laughs> microbes in your mouth are going to process the food and compose them for your body, right? So mm -hmm. point is that when you start to read research, you know what is going to be out there popular in the next four years. You start to see where the world is headed. So to me, so I read a lot. And the second thing what I do is, I am never afraid to share my ideas. A lot of people who are entrepreneurs, they always feel, oh, what if he steals my idea? 
point is the more you share the more people give you feedback and more your idea gets better so if you talk to 10 or 20 people you will people will poke holes at it and you say you know i didn't think about that i didn't think about that that's an interesting question and guess what you keep improving on that idea and when you get to a point where you start to build the conviction that you say you know what i think there is something here here and then you go out and you never stop that means now the next thing you need to do is to the crazier and the more audacious the idea easier it is to become executing executable and here's why when mm-hmm. you have a in idea that can help a billion people guess what happened the best and the brightest in the world want to work on that problem the good thing mm-hmm. now is you could sit in india or you could be sitting in uh, in any place in the world in this world remote work i mean it doesn't matter where you are you could be sitting in california you are in india it makes no difference we look exactly the same so point is now you have access to the best and the brightest people around the world you have access to the same literature same technology same uh, science reports that anyone else in the world has there is nothing different whether you are in, in any part of the world third is the capital is not patriotic capital mm-hmm. goes where the opportunities are you create an opportunity in india there is going to be a 10 billion dollar company in that's india that's true and yeah people used to say oh nobody no company in india have ever be 10 billion dollar because people just don't believe that. that's not true now you look at the things yourself but it's a flip yeah. card or whether you know pick a name you want all these companies are being created because once you create opportunity money comes and i think mm-hmm. i hear the same problem in europe people say oh you know in india or europe you know people who have money they want simple problem they don't want us to have a audacious ideas because they will never fund it and when i talk to the people who have money they say people here just have small ideas they just don't have big idea that's why we don't fund them <laughs> it is really a, it literally feeds on each other they think they mm-hmm. don't want to hear big ideas so they come up with a small idea they don't fund the small ideas because they want to hear big ideas yeah. <laughs> <laughs> irony yeah So um so you have also mentioned right you know when you have this crazy big ideas then you can pull in the best minds right um so that's like one part of it but i i think there's more to it and i would like to know more on because what i am also amazed by the thing that you do is you have built like a team of best minds in the business to you know come you know and believe in your vision while you don't know a lot about you know the industry whether you know if whether that's with the company that you have with is moon express where you are saying that we are going to go to the moon mine the moon and bring the stuff back here or whether that's with viom you are not a biochemical engineer or you know the expert in that but you have managed to get like these top experts in this industry to join your vision right so so how how do you do it so first thing again having a problem that is meaningful so for example when i say imagine a world where being sick is a truly a choice that means you get to decide whether you want to be sick or not what if we can tell you what is it that you need to do to be healthy and you say i don't care guess what you made a choice when i see that the head of the ibm walks and say you know to do that you need to have a powerful ai i'm going to quit my job and i'm going to work with you to solve this problem you know why he says that is going to be my legacy i have done everything that one could do i made all the money in the world i could make but i want to do something that is going to be my legacy and i want to come and mm. work with you guess what when he joined then the people say you know the this guy who had developed the technology at los almos he say you know what i know my federal job is really really secure but some day in life i have to look back and think what did i do i'm going to just quit the damn job and i'm going to come and join now i have two mm. great people that you know at human longevity these are the guys working with craig venter these are the people who invented the genes right craig venter is the father of human genomics the whole team see you know genes i am convinced what you, you're right genes don't matter it's a gene expression i'm going to quit this gene we're spending my life on the genes i'm going to come and help you do the gene expression work and now i had all these people guess what every vc calls and say what are you working on why are all <laughs> these people coming and joining you and the more you tell them you don't need the money it is like you know having a red flag in front of a bull they charge right 
you have to have my money now, right? So my point is suddenly yeah. everybody gets interested and now you have the resources you need, you have the team you need and you start to, you know, basically snowball starts to roll down. And that's really how you take the most audacious ideas. And part of it is, you know, obviously I have a great track record, you know, but guess what? The track record was built by doing it. Track record wasn't built Absolutely. by having a track record. So yeah. my point is, the first company I started, I did it. It's not like I had a track record at that time. So the point I'm trying to make is that go out and do it. How many first-time entrepreneurs, look, Mark Zuckerberg, first-time entrepreneur, got a $200 billion company, right? My <laughs> point is, this is so easy if you start to look at WhatsApp, you know, $20 billion, first-time entrepreneurs with no money on food stamps, right? So, mm. you know, point is, and they were two people from Ukraine who didn't have any money. <laughs> So it doesn't take, you know, it's not like you have to be rich. It's not like you have to have a track record. It's not like you have to know a lot of people. The good thing is the social media allows you to get your message out to as many people. You and I can talk about something. Next thing you know, there'll be 100,000 people listening to it. And someone would send me an email and say, hey, I really have this great idea. Can you help me with this? Right? Yeah, that's correct. That's so true. Um, so what's your advice to the kids who are growing up in India and maybe in one of the IITs or just starting out in their life? What would be your advice to them? You know, never be afraid to fail and constantly keep dreaming. Don't let someone tell you that you can't do it, right? And part of it is me saying that, you know, fall in love with yourself. And I don't mean to be self-conceited. What I mean by that is don't look for someone's approval. Don't look to say, how, you know, someone to tell you how smart you are, how handsome you are, how it doesn't matter what they think of you. What matters is what you think of yourself. So if today I walk and someone say, you know, you're really, really stupid. And my answer is, you know, thank you very much. I hope you'll get to know me someday better. And please, I hope you find a peace in yourself because you probably don't love yourself to hate someone else, right? Because sure. when you love yourself, you can't hate someone. And when you hate yourself, you hate everyone else, right? So my point is, it is very hard for people who are just in love with themselves to come out with anger and hate. And this idea of, he made me angry, he made me frustrated. The answer is, you and I both know in the Eastern philosophy, no one does anything to you. You do that to yourself. You make yourself angry. You make yourself frustrated. No one else can make you frustrated. Awesome. So where do you see this world in the next uh, 15 to 20 years with, with these incredible things happening around? Like what's, what's your predictions about another 20, 15, 20 years? Well, the interesting thing is, BJ, that you know, we are living in one of the most innovative times in the human history. I am so absolutely true. convinced the next decade is going to be the decade of innovation. If I may make a prediction, I would say in 10 years, we will get rid of most of the chronic diseases, including cancer. And that wow. is really, yes, in 10 years, our grandkids and the kids and the grandkids are going to be saying, Dad, Grandpa, in your time, people used to just die because we couldn't figure out what was going on. You mean people just had diseases and you didn't do anything? You mean people just lost their memory and you thought that was just okay? Hey, what kind of generation was that, right? <laughs> and But it doesn't mean they don't have any problems. They'll be solving the problem like, why do we have to talk to communicate our ideas? And honestly, if you think about what we are doing here, this is 20 years ago when we used to have modems, where a 300 yeah. baud modem where you would dial into a phone line and there'll be a tiny bandwidth that you can actually use to get to the internet. This True. is what we are doing. We are using a 300 baud speech to communicate mm. our ideas. In their thing, they'll be thinking, why can't I just connect the brain to everyone and they can upload my brain and my thoughts? I can just look at them and just communicate my ideas. Can I subscribe to your brain so that as you develop new ideas, I can just upload them and I'll pay you a monthly fee for it, right? Wow. <laughs> wow, that sounds, that sounds crazy. Um, it's not crazy. My point is, it is starting to happen now. I mean, look at Elon is doing Neuralink and there are a bunch of people who are looking at computing the brain to the computers. Guess what's happening? Suddenly, just even the idea of, like my mom would say, you can't be in two places at the same time. What does it she mean by you can't? And the reason is because she feels, what does it really mean to be in a place? We have these sensors called eyes and ears and the smell and the touch. 
And that's what tells us who we are, where we are. And our brain doesn't know where the signal is coming from. If, what if the signal could be coming from uh, in Mumbai? And I think my brain thinks I'm in Mumbai. And the signal mm-hmm. comes from Atlanta. My brain thinks I'm in Atlanta. What difference does it make to the brain? And what if it is asynchronously communicating with you and you can be in two places at the same time, literally having the same feeling as if you're there? Wow. So I'm, I'm like really uh, inspired and like really blown away with the crazy ideas that you're sharing here. And I'm, I, I think, uh, you know, audience are also fascinated with, you know, the, the really great ideas that you that you have and that you're working on. So I want to talk about one more thing before we talk about the next thing is which you talk a lot about is building this intellectual curiosity um, in the kids, right? So before we talk about intellectual curiosity, what I want to ask you is, do you believe in the current system of uh, you know traditional education? What's your thought on the whole idea of uh, you know, going to the college to pick up the knowledge and so on and so forth. Like, what's what's your thought on that? There are two parts of the thing. One is that, you know, learning skills are going to become obsolete because any skill that you learn, by the time you learn, it becomes obsolete. So the learning mm-hmm. to learn really becomes the key. And having what I would say is vocabulary in different areas is really good. So to me, the education really means having a broad based knowledge of various areas. So you have the basic vocabulary. So when you read a science paper, you say, oh, now the research shows that DNA can be modified using CRISPR. You say, oh, that DNA, I get that now. Okay, so they are talking, I don't know what this CRISPR is, but there is something I understand can be changed here. So I have basic vocabulary. Now I can learn more on top of that. So to me, learning to learn will become the most important thing. Learning to solve problems. That means, and the problems don't tend to be unidisciplinary, they tend to be multidisciplinary. That means you now need to have enough, just enough knowledge about a lot of different subjects. So as an entrepreneur, the broad-based knowledge of a lot of areas is better than having one deep knowledge of one area. But then you hire the experts who are really deeply expert in these areas, but they will never be the person who will be able to connect all the dots. So your job is to take all these experts and connect the dots together to solve the problem that looks too complex. Wow, I think that's a brilliant, uh, you know, tip for a lot of entrepreneurs because as an entrepreneur, it's much easier. Or sometimes we get lost in like going deeper and yeah. trying to be yeah. the experts ourselves rather than you know bringing the experts and helping them work together and connect. I think I have heard you say that in in one of the interviews, right? You know how you your job is to like connect different things and yeah. you know earlier in this interview as well, you have said right you want to bring these smart people and get them to work together. And I think it was Jack Ma who said the problem with the smartest people is that it's not that they are not smart, but it's that to get them together and get them to work together and collaborate with each other. And I think that's, that's the real job of an entrepreneur. Great. So Naveen, now I have this quick round called enlightening round. It's more of a rapid fire kind of a round. Uh, So here we go. What inspires you to do everything that you do? You know, to me, is really waking up in the morning and feeling that burning desire that if I do something that could really help someday, uh, you know, people live better lives. And I think that to me is really what drives me every day is that, you know, my day's work could change people's life. And it is worth doing it because especially both all, you know, all of us who come from humble background, we look back and see God has given us so much. How do we pay our debt back to the society? And this is how you see, you know, in hour of extra work, if we can inspire someone else to actually live to their dreams, it is worth doing. And that's the reason I don't mind waking up at 6 a.m. and talking to entrepreneurs or, you know, at the night doing it because you never know who one kid who is listening to this would actually go out and do something. And that could help a million people live a better life. And that to me, my hour is worth well spent there. Awesome. Which one daily habit do you believe has been game changer for you in your success journey? So first of all, that's a bad question, as you know that, Mm -hmm. uh, because Mm -hmm. habits don't make people. It is the mindset that makes people. So anyone who follows my habit is not going to become a me. They have to develop their own habits. But the trick is the mindset. How do you think big? How do you uh, get yourself to not think of a problem that you set out to solve, your idea may not work. Idea that does not work 
is simply a stepping stone to a different idea and a better idea. So you don't feel you failed until you give up, right? So that's idea is the, so, but generally I find myself, one thing I do that I really helps me is always feel gratitude that every day mm-hmm. I ask myself that am I better off today intellectually, emotionally, spiritually? Have I done anything that actually has helped someone could be better today? And every day I feel that if I am improving myself and I'm making someone else life better, then I have actually lived a good day. So always feel that improve, you know, you start with yourself. Am I better off today? And then you say, have I made someone else life better today? And that having that gratitude really helps. What's the best piece of advice that you have received in your life? You know, live your life as if it's your last day. And when you wake up in the morning, make sure that you do something because you actually have uh, you know, outlived your life. That means you still have another day to go do something more useful. Beautiful. What is the one wrong belief you have held for the longest time in your life about yourself? Yeah, I think, you know, it is all we all felt at some point of time that I can't do something. And I think to a large extent, we always have this, uh, you know, innate what if, you know, this this particular time i just can't is this the time for me to ride into sunset what if i start the next company and that just does not work have i really outlived something it's like the actor who refused to go out the thing and people say you're just really a bad <laughs> now it's time for you to retire right and i you know you always have the doubt but you wake up and say what if what if i actually could solve this problem right and even though your kids tell you dad it's just Go relax now. And he said, no, <laughs> there's plenty of time to rest when I die. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I, I, this, this is one follow-up question, which I really, I mean, in the enlightening yeah. round, because you have shared this interesting thing, right? So you have said like, you know, for the crazy visionary like you, right? So who have these crazy ideas, right? And then is it like the bigger the problem? Is it the bigger, does it take like bigger effort for you to, cope up through it or how do you how do you convince yourself oh okay i mean it's totally fine but still there's a lot of lesson how do you how do you go about coping up with the failures well so the thing is you take a large problem and you divide them into smaller pieces and you're always working on a small piece but you never forget your north star so the idea is you have your vision you have your north star and you're starting to take one mile at a time and you're going to keep moving forward and know that even if you don't reach your destination, it is okay because someone else is going to come behind you who is going to pick up the baton and is going to stand on your shoulder to get, take it across the finish line. But the problem will get solved. So God forbid if you're not successful, but you know you have pushed the humanity forward for someone else to be taking it across the finish line and you still contributed. Awesome. What do you want to be remembered for? You know, being just a great father and, you know, uh, and someone who actually made some difference in people's lives. You read like crazy and you read and learn a lot. I'm sure it's going to be not easy one for you, but could you share a book or two that has influenced you personally in the recent past, which you would recommend a lot of people? Uh, and maybe especially on the, you know, on the thinking or maybe questioning everything on, on those lines. I mean, I hate to say it, but, you know, on the, uh, in terms of mindset thinking, the book that I wrote called Moonshots, uh, that mm. is uh, forwarded by Richard Branson, is really a book about how do you look at sustainability, why the bigger problems are easier to solve, how do you go out and develop a mindset of abundance, how do you get rid of this idea of if you win, someone has to lose, or if someone wins, you lost, the idea of there's more of everything you can create rather than has to be a zero-sum game. So I would just say that's probably a great book to read. <laughs> <laughs> um, so if you were to start this journey all over again, mm-hmm. what are those three things that you would, you think that you would have done differently? Um, none, none not, not one. And here's why. If you change anything that I have done in the past, it will change the trajectory of where I end up. Because it's like every single thing you change, it actually takes you on a different path. I am just so happy with life where I am. I would not want to change one iota of thing because if I change one iota of a thing, 
I would be a different person today. Awesome. All right, Naveen. So I have got one last question okay. you know, that I would like to ask you before we end this. But um, I would like to thank you so much for taking this time. And it's been incredible, incredible having this conversation with you. And it's always great pleasure in listening to you and share these big ideas. And uh, it makes myself believe more in me. And I'm, I'm sure that's what you know that's exactly what it's going to do for a lot of people who are listening to this podcast so you know before i ask you that question if people would like to reach out to you or learn more about you know vayam by the way when are you, when are you bringing vayam to india <laughs> you know very soon honestly that's my number one thing on my list to do is to just bring vayam to india because there's so many people who could benefit from it so that is i put keep telling my team that's got to be the next thing we do so I keep I'm checking your website, the by the way, like for the next, past three years, I think at least a dozen times I have kept checking like, you know, 30, is it available in India? Honestly, before the end of the year, I'm going to push it to make sure this happens. Awesome. That's such a, that, that would be like, you know, a great thing because as I said, right, I've been passionately waiting for this because yeah. now I have also come to believe after, I think it was yeah. you, one of the conversations back in 2017 where I listened, right? I think it makes, he's making a lot of sense about the gut mic, you know, yeah. uh, uh, microwave and, uh, you know, the more we go through like the, the, just before this one, uh, I had um, somebody from Deepak Chopra's, uh, yeah. you know, somebody who has worked with Deepak Chopra, Dr. Suhas Sir Sagar, who is a, you know, terrific Ayurvedic doctor. Mm-hmm. And he mentioned about the similar things, about simple habits and so on yeah. and so forth. And then it's coming back again and again to gut. And, uh, you know, I can't wait for Vyam to and be so here I just in India. Recorded so. the Deepak, I just recorded a session with Deepak uh, yesterday on, uh, just on this topic about how do you reinvent humans because yeah. uh, everything about us can be changed. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm so looking forward to that. But how people can learn more about Biome and, you know, stay in touch so that as soon as it launches, so that they can get notified and so on and so forth. Obviously, you can go to Biome.com. And in addition to that, you can follow me on the uh, Instagram, on LinkedIn, on uh, Facebook and Twitter. I mean, I'm, I'm on, I really look at all of that. And you can always reach out to me. I'm the easiest person to reach out. Send me an email, send me a direct message on any social media. That's how you reach out to me. I'm always responding. So please feel free yeah. to reach out to me. Awesome. I link all that on the description. So here's the last question, David. Yeah. Imagine that you are standing on a stadium and this one is the largest stadium that has ever been built in the history of the world. And there are millions of people on that stadium and every single city is occupied. And there you are on stage and you have been given only one minute of the time Mm -hmm. to share the most important lesson that you have learned in your life. What would be your message? I would just simply say, you know, stay intellectually curious because the day you stop learning is the day you die. So never, ever stop learning. Always dream, you know, dream so big that people think you're crazy. Never be afraid to fail and, you know, live your dreams as if it's the last day. Wow. It's been phenomenal having you here on the show, Naveen. Thank you so much for being at the show. Thank you. Thank you, BJ. I appreciate it. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much for listening to this conversation with Naveen Jain. I hope you learned something or got some inspiration from the episode. If you did, please share the episode with your friends by visiting the show notes page at theinspiringtalk.com forward slash 101. And also you can take a screenshot of this episode and put it on your Instagram story so that more people can know about this episode. And when you do so, don't forget to tag me at the rate BJ Speaks. Thank you so much for listening. I'll catch you in the next. Now, go out there and do something inspiring. <laughs>